pray the Lord to bless us together this morning in our time of worship. I got so used to preaching out of uh, Matthew 13, I almost started to go back. To <laughs> I still might go back there. There's, you know, there's a couple of the parables we didn't touch on in there. We might get back to them at some point in time. But I, I have had Lamentation 3 in my mind since before I started that study on uh, the kingdom parable and just could not get free from it. You know, it's amazing how our Lord... Uh, uses things in our own individual life to uh, bring us to see the, the glorious grace and mercy of our Lord uh, through the person and work of our dear Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. How um, uh, true it is that we need God's mercy every moment of our life, don't we? We seem to be, you know, we're raised in a religious world that seems to be of the opinion that you get mercy and you don't ever need it again we need it ever and always I don't know about you but I am I am all too keenly aware of my sinfulness I know that don't sound good coming from your preacher but that's just the present reality I wish I could no I don't I'd start to say I wish I could send a ridiculous if I did I'd, I'd look down my nose at you I really would I'd I would, I would, your thoughts would be the same thoughts as mine. Why ain't he or she like me? And it ain't got nothing to be with it. It's, it's not walk as I walk and you'll be okay. Walk as the Lord Jesus Christ walk, look into him as the author and finisher of your faith. Well, actually, I had these verses in mind. I was going to try to preach it all in one message. I don't think I'm going to be able to do it all in one message. I was talking with Bill earlier in the week, and I had worked most of the week on the message and it only covered verse 21 22 and I just couldn't get beyond it and I was able to work it out to where I did get through verse 23 but there's some more wonderful verses uh, beginning in verse 24 on down that I would like to come back and deal with and I, I might do that uh, next Sunday I'll just have to see which way I go this week but I want you to turn with me to Lamentations chapter 3 and I hope and I pray the Lord will, will bless this message to, to your heart and to your mind and to my heart and to my mind and my understanding to let us key in on one, this, one, this one grand attribute of our God, his faithfulness. Great. That's a fine title this message because it's going to end up at the end of verse 23. Great is thy faithfulness. You ever remember singing that song, Great is thy faithfulness? Great is thy faithfulness. I sat there this week for a long time and just looked at the screen and thought about what I wanted to write down. And it seems like the subjects always come back the same way. They always begin at the same place. The issue, the problem is with man. It's not with God. See, here's the thing. By nature and the reason I know this to be true because I know myself was a natural man and I'm still a natural man. Still have that old sinful Adamic nature in me. But here's the thing. By nature, all men think, and that's the problem. They think that salvation is somehow, in some way, conditioned on themselves. Either conditioned on their obedience or their sincerity are their religious efforts, or even worst of all, conditioned on their faith? Listen to our Lord Jesus Christ. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, that he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. And, you, know, you need to stop right there. This isn't in my notes. But you can't get beyond that, that phrase right there. He that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. What's the will of the Father which is in heaven? Huh? What is it? That you, that you become a shining light in a dark, unregenerate world. No, that's not it. This is the will of the Father. That you believe on him whom God hath sent. You know, fulfill the will of the Father. That's just too simple. That's impossible for the natural man to rest completely on Christ's person and his work. Oh, you, you mean when I say, 
when you sin, you rest where? When you do not sin, what do you rest on? See? We rest on him at all times. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not done prophesied in thy name? And in thy name cast out devils. And listen to this one. In thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. That's a tragic thing. People talk about tragedies. That's a tragedy. It was too young to die. It was a tragedy. This is a tragedy here for somebody to spend their whole life doing what they think's right, thinking that God somehow or another is going to give them life. They've merited life over what they've done. And to find out after that whole life spent that they've missed salvation because they missed Christ. Solomon, in his wisdom, wrote this natural false assumption made by men so important he wrote it in the Proverbs twice there is a way which seemeth right unto man but the end thereof is the way of death he wrote it a second time there is a way not which seemeth right it's the only word change in the verse the second time he wrote there is a way that seems right unto a man but the end thereof is the way of death if we're not right anywhere else, we've got to be perfectly right and perfectly clear on this matter. The salvation and eternal life of God's elect does not rely on anything done in the sinner or by the sinner. Salvation from start to finish, like Jonah said, is of the Lord in its entirety. And here's the thing that separates the grace and mercy of our God from any other way. It is an act of sovereign grace and sovereign mercy by the true and living God. You know, I, I got to looking at that this way. This is why I get in trouble even on these introductions. I get to looking at too much stuff, but I can't, I can't, it just, it gets in my mind and I can't get free from it. Yeah, the, the very first time the words grace and mercy are used together to combine in the scriptures, you know where it's used at? First time grace and mercy is used in the same, same statement. It was when Lot had been delivered out of Sodom and Gomorrah. His wife had been turned into a pillar of salt. And now he and his two daughters are up there dwelling in a cave. And listen to what he declares. Behold, now thy servant hath found grace in thy sight. Listen to this. And thou hast magnified thy mercy, which thou hast showed unto me in saving. And he didn't even mention his daughters in saving my life. <laughs> you see that? I, salvation is personal. He thanks God for his, that he found grace in God's sight and that God had bestowed, magnified his mercy by saving him out of Sodom and Gomorrah. Answer this one question. What had Lot done to deserve God's grace and mercy? Hmm? What had he done? Matter of fact, I'll go further than that. He had done everything, had he not? He had done absolutely everything that should have called down God's judgment and wrath on him. But folks, he had done absolutely nothing to merit God's grace and mercy. I mean, it, it amazes me how the natural mind thinks. It shows the darkness and depravity that are in us all by nature. That when it says that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, false religion and false professors believe somehow or another Noah did something to get saved. But they disregard that the verse right before it says Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. What does the verse before that say? That every thought 
of every imagination of every man was only evil and that continually. But <laughs> Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Lord, why? It's not for us to ask why. God just did. I couldn't get beyond, when I think about the mercy of the God, I, I can't help but think of Isaiah's description of our God. We preached on it a couple of weeks ago. I, I am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for mine own sake. Did it for himself. And since he did it to satisfy himself, because that's what he means by that verse, I will not remember thy sin. Why? Because I blotted them out for my own sake. Why? So I can be just and justified. Showing mercy to the, to the undeserving folk, it's God's glory. Try to keep God's words concerning himself to Moses in your mind when God declared to Moses his glory. Moses asked our Lord a question. He beseeched him and he said, Show me your glory. Show me. The Lord said, here, here, I will make my goodness pass before you. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee. Make the connection. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. My question when I see that is this, what's the name? Jesus. Uh, not just a historical name like that. And what's really interesting, when he proclaims the name, listen to this name. What's his name? Will be gracious to whom I'll be gracious. And I will show mercy to whom I will show mercy. You know the name of the Lord? There it is. I'll have compassion on whom I'll have compassion. And I'll be gracious to whom I'll be gracious. And I'll show mercy to who I show mercy. How can he do that? Only one way. In the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. As we look at the prophet's words this morning here in Lamentation. My prayer and my hope is that the Holy Spirit will draw us to see. Christ throughout the whole of it. That's, that's my goal this morning. We're in an Old Testament passage, but we're looking for Christ. Look at verse 21. He says, This I recall to my mind, therefore have I hope. This whole book from chapter 1, really throughout the whole entirety, the entire book of, of Lamentations, it's, it's only five chapters long. I'd encourage you to go read all five of them. But pay particular attention to the ones that start in chapter 1, verse 1, and lead up to chapter 3, verse 20. I tell you what, Israel had been through the grist mill as a nation, and they had. And what we have here is we have a lamentation. This is a cry of sorrow. He's lamenting. And the prophet had lamented the sorrows of his nation that he was a part of, all that they had endured, but they had endured it for a specific purpose. What had, they, what had they done? They had rebelled against their God. But he's also lamenting the fact that, that he, his own personal heartache and sorrow as he went through it right along with him. All Israel suffered. Both the elect of God and the non-elect Israelites. And he was one of God's choice prophets. Chosen to preach the gospel in his generation for 40 years. Nobody's ever going to listen to you. You still preach. He'd been faithful to God's command to preach in his generation. And he's lamenting the fact, what am I going I'm going through every bit of it. Go back and read what he, he lists in these first three chapters. What that nation had experienced and what he himself had suffered. 
But when he thinks back about all these things and he laments them, God, the Holy Spirit moves him to say this, this I recall to my mind. Therefore have I hope. What? The suffering? You going to call that to your mind and think about all these things? Now, what's he calling to his mind? He, he calls to his mind the hope. Therefore have I hope. That's his regulation. I have hope. Everything's, everything's messed up. Israel's in bondage. I'm in captivity. We're under the, the hand of Almighty God. But yet I'll recall this to mind. He said, I'm about to tell, about to write to you. And his recollection is this, therefore have I hope. Job used the same word in the midst of his trials. He'd lost everything, Kenny, absolutely everything. And who had sent those trials into his life? God had. Here's his word. Though he slay me. Here's the same word, therefore have I hope. Though he slay me, yet I will trust him. But I will maintain mine own ways before him. And what we have here is the same hope that the father of the faithful had. Who? Abraham. That he possessed and exercised in the face of what was absolutely, what appeared to be absolute hopelessness, wasn't it? Who against hope, believed in hope. That he might become father of many nations according to that which God had spoken. So shall thy seed be. And he being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. How do you give glory to God? No. Hallelujah. No, no, that's not it. How do you give glory to God? Here it is. Being fully persuaded that what God hath promised, he's able to perform. So shall thy seed be. I'm a hundred years old. I'm an old man. My wife's an old man. How am I, how's this going to happen? He believed the God who promised it. And he believed the God that promised it because he knew the God who promised it had the power to do it. And it's the same for every one of God's children in every good generation. If we're Abraham's seed, you know what we are? According to Galatians chapter 3, we're heirs according to, the, to his promise. But he, here's something that we have to always remember. Hope has to have a foundation. It has to have a ground. Otherwise, if it doesn't have a hope or a ground, if it doesn't have a foundation or a ground, it's not really hope. So what's the ground of Je or foundation of Jeremiah's hope as well as the ground or foundation of our hope? What is it? Here it is. Look at what he says in verse 22. It is the Lord's mercies. That we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. I don't want to get hung up in the weeds, but I want to get hung up in the words. That word translated mercies, it means goodness, kindness, or faithfulness. And the original word that's translated that we are not consumed means to finish, to be finished, to be exhausted. Here's the best translation of it, to be destroyed. So by these words, the prophet Jeremiah, what he declares under the inspiration of God, the Holy Spirit, is this. It's the Lord's, and that's L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Who's he talking about? The Lord, the Jehovah. The self-existing one. It's of the Lord's goodness, his kindness, his faithfulness that you and I aren't exhausted. That we aren't utterly destroyed. And see, he had some personal experience in this thing. Even though national Israel had suffered great loss and had even been carried away into captivity, you know what the Lord had graciously done? He had left them a seed. 
He'd left him a seed, a remnant, a promised mercy. That promised mercy was what? Christ, the Messiah, lest they be utterly destroyed. And I tell you, it's the same with every believing justified saint. Listen to what Paul wrote. Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. What did he do that for? To make reconciliation for the sins of his people. Our continuance in God's goodness and the blessedness of God our eternal security, it doesn't rest on our faithfulness. It doesn't rest on our repentance. And it doesn't even rest on our faith. What does it rest on? It rests on God's mercies toward us through our Lord Jesus Christ alone. King David wrote it this way. Have mercy upon me. O oh God. According to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgression. That word David used, translated have mercy, it's the same word that Jeremiah used. It's the Lord's mercy that we're not consumed. Paul told the Hebrew believers this, seeing that we have a great high priest that's passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our profession. We have not a high priest that cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us, therefore, come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need that word mercy in this verse it means kindness or goodwill toward the miserable with a desire to help him our Lord stated it this way but go ye therefore and learn what this meaneth I will have mercy and not sacrifice for I am not come to call the righteous, but come to call sinners to repentance. But Jeremiah added another statement. Because his compassions fail not. You think about that. It's of the Lord's mercies were not consumed because his compassions fail not. That phrase, because his compassions, it's one word in the original. And you know it's used a bunch of other times, 32 times, the most times it's used in Old Testament. You know what just translated that phrase? Mercy. Mercy. Here's the same word. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to the, thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy, here it is, tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. It means to love, to love deeply, to have mercy upon to be compassionate toward, to have tender affections, affections toward one. See, not only does God's goodness and his kindness and his faithfulness guarantee that we won't be utterly destroyed and cast out, but his deep love and compassion and tender mercies, you know what they do? They never fail, ever. God's mercy and grace, folks, they're as eternal as God is. That's why we read Psalm 136 in the call to worship. 26 times our God said in everything that's been created and is created, everything that exists, what's it there for? His mercy endureth forever. It's the same as his love. He says this, Yet the Lord hath appeared of old unto me, the same prophet Jeremiah that's lamenting what he's in and what he's experienced. He wrote, The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I've loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, and I emphasize this phrase, Therefore with loving kindness have I drawn thee. That phrase, therefore with loving kindness, it's the same word translated because his compassions in our text. 
Do, do you see the eternal, unchangeable mercy of, that our God has toward you and me as sinners? But look at his next phrase. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. That word new means new. <laughs> Better translation of it would be a new thing. New thing. Are fresh. Over in Jeremiah 31, verse 2, 22, Jeremiah used the same word that's, that's translated here, new, new every morning. I told you a better translation is new thing. He used the same word under the spirit of prophecy to describe God's continued unfailing mercy to us through his glorious champion. The Lord Jesus Christ. I, I, this is an amazing verse. I, I've read this, never paid attention to it till I make the connection because it's the same word as we're talking about in our text this morning. They're new every morning. Here it is. How long wilt thou go about, O thou backsliding daughter? For the Lord hath created a new thing in the earth. A man, woman shall compass a man. What's that talking about? A woman shall compass a man. That's our Lord Jesus Christ. That's Mary compassing that man. Here's a question. What's new every morning? What's new every morning? The Lord's tender mercies and his compassion toward the objects of his love. And see, the fact that they're new every morning proves that they never fail because he says they're new every day. Every morning. All of us, all of God's redeemed. In every generation, we have instances in our own personal lives of God's never failing tender mercies and compassions to us every day, both in a physical way and in a spiritual way. When we draw away, when our Lord shows himself merciful. He doesn't cast us away. I might add, I might be wrong too. I got to, I got to thinking about this new every day. New, hold your place here. Look over to Exodus chapter sixteen. He said it was. He said that these mercies of, of God, continued mercies of God, are new every day. And I got, to, I could not get out of my mind the thought about national Israel and their rebellion out there in the wilderness as they wandered. Remember, they were, they were hungry. Remember, they were thirsty, and God gave them water out of a rock. They were hungry, and what did our God do? He gave them angels food. Look at what it says here, Exodus 16, verse 15. When the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, It's manna, for they wist not what it was. And Moses said unto them, This is the bread which the Lord hath given you to eat. This is the thing that the Lord hath commanded. Now notice what he says. Gather ye of it every man according to his eating, an omer for every man according to the number of your persons. Take ye every man for them which are at his tents. The children of Israel did so and gathered some more, some less. And when they did met it out, met out they did met, met, <laughs> met it with an omer. He that gathered much had nothing over, and he that gathered little had no lack. They gathered every man according to his eating. And Moses said, Let no man leave it to the morning. Notwithstanding, they hearkened not unto Moses, but some of them left, it, left of it until the morning, and it bred worms and stank, and Moses was wroth with them. And they gathered it every morning. Every morning. Every man according to his eating. And when the sun waxed hot, it melted. Those Jews, every one of them got exactly what they needed. Every man, every woman, every child. And I tell you, as God's redeemed, we receive the exact proportion of God's mercy from our God that's necessary for our lives every day. All that we need, and it's always fresh, it's always new, and it's just exactly what we need. But notice his next word. Great, and you see is is in italics. He says, great thy faithfulness. 
Word translated great means much or exceedingly. And that word translated thy faithfulness means firmness, fidelity, steadfastness, steadiness. The security of God's mercies never fail. And they continue new every day. The fact that they continue new every day rests on the one who promised the mercy. Again, God's continued mercies, they rest where? In Christ alone. King David, speaking by the spirit of prophecy, wrote of Christ, but my faithfulness and mercy shall be with him. And him is capitalized. It's not talking about David. It's talking about who? It's talking about Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. And in my name shall his horn be exalted. You understand what that means? Think about this. But my faithfulness. What's he talking about there? God's faithfulness is personified where? In the Lord Jesus Christ. The promised seed. Jude wrote this. The very God of peace. Thank you. No, Paul wrote it. The very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful he that calleth you. He shall also do it. Great is thy faithfulness. I believe the Spirit's intention in moving Jeremiah to record this, this phrase, great thy faithfulness, was to direct our hearts to this attribute of our God. What attribute is that? His faithfulness. His faithfulness. Listen to what old, one old author wrote on it, and we'll quit right here this morning. He said, the attribute of God's faithfulness is meant by this state which is another reason why the people of God are not consumed, since God's faithfulness never fails. God is faithful to himself and cannot deny himself. He is faithful to his counsels and his purposes, which shall all be truly accomplished by his power and his might. And to his covenant and promises which shall be fulfilled. And God is also faithful to his son, the surety and savior of his people. Now we'll stop right there. I might come back next week and look at the rest of this passage. But what, what, what an encouragement to you and me as sinners by birth, by nature, and practice, and by choice who are so filled with unfaithfulness every moment of our lives. Yet, what does he do? He remains faithful. And thank God, his mercy endures forever. And when you get up tomorrow morning, you know what? They're going to be new. They're going to be new every day of our life. Let's stand together. We dismiss. Lord bless you and keep you till we see you next Lord's Day. Donald, would you lead us in closing prayer?